I uh, miss having to adjust my mic as I'm coming up here because I'm usually dealing with Edwin. I think I would rather deal with him and be a little late getting the mic adjusted than have him not here. But uh, he's doing a little better today. He's fevered yesterday. Uh, today feeling mostly better, but Megan wanted to keep him home just because uh, precautionary. He was still having a fever at 3 in the morning last night. He was still running a little hot. But uh, like I said, this morning he's doing good. Uh, so the, for this morning's lesson, I want to start off by asking a question. Religion, what is it? How would you define it? Or maybe rather, how would the world define it? What is usually identified with the word religion? When somebody says religion, like what, what type of images, like what do you think about? What about the Christian religion? What type of imagery is usually associated with Christianity? You know, maybe it's a people. You know, it's that's the white man's religion. That's the, the United States is a Christian nation. Even though uh, Christianity is dying in Western cultures and rapidly spreading throughout Africa and Asia, uh, I believe there are more Christians in in uh, China and, and India individually than there are in the United States now. Even though Christianity was founded by a Middle Eastern Jewish man, somehow it has this bad rap of, of, of being, well, that's just that white man's religion. What about holidays? You think about holidays associated with the Christian religion, people think of what? Christmas and Easter. What about other festivals? Other seasonal practices, such as Lent, or maybe a time of fasting, or a ceremony of oil anointing, or perhaps... Of foot washing. There are some congregations and churches that practice these things. What about buildings? What type of buildings people think of when they think of the Christian religion? They identify a steeple, maybe a, a sanctuary. Most famously, probably think of the Catholic cathedrals and their beautiful artistry. I still remember from a few years ago when Notre Dame went up in flames. What a, what a tragedy. And you hear people often say, and, and, we, and we say it too when we're, when we're describing you know, different churches, we say, well, that's the church that has the dog park. There's one in Carroll that does. That's the church that has the gymnasium. That's the church whose auditorium looks like it's a Nashville concert hall. Well, that's the church that has the rock band front and center. Well, that's the church that has a baptistry and doesn't have room for a piano up here. People think of religion, they think of these different types of building structures. What about leadership? What, what do you, when it comes to the Christian religion, what do people identify with? The Pope? Uh, cardinals, bishops, priests? Uh, maybe other TV evangelists or... Or big names like, well, well, that's the church where John MacArthur preaches, or or Vadi Bakum, or what, what's uh, Steve Furtick is a big name I get seen. Joel Osteen, another big name. Oh, that's the church where he preaches. That's the church where Tyler Hawkins preaches, right? People think of a religion, and then and they start identifying a religion as as the, the leader that's there becomes the face of that religion. What about other imagery? You think of a cross, fish, uh, maybe you think of uh, artistic renderings of Mary or of Jesus, uh, the manger scene, uh, maybe, maybe candles or burning incense, and you think of, of maybe water, or baptism, or communion. And what about music? You think of, think of religion, and you start thinking about music, and maybe... Maybe you have this idea of a traditional, quote-unquote traditional, of, it's just an organ or piano kind of there for accompaniment. Or, or maybe it's, it's contemporary and, they, and they, they don't need a preacher because they've got a rock band, right? Or, or maybe, maybe you think of the scriptural and historical of, well, that's, that's a cappella singing. 
But what if all of these things were taken away? All of it. Gone. Then what? If you take away all of the ritual, all of the traditional, all of the ceremony, all the customs, all the iconography, what is left of the Christian faith? What is left of religion? When all of those things are gone, how would others, how would non-Christians recognize, identify a Christian person? How would non-Christians identify a Christian church? How would we ourselves even know that we are truly living a Christian lifestyle and that we really are Christians if you take away, take, take away all of this? What are we left with? And that is the danger of formalized ceremonies of formalized religion of having rituals and traditions now they're not all bad so don't get me wrong they're not all wrong they're not all bad but the problem here is that Christendom either by our, our own fault directly or, or perhaps indirectly uh, we've allowed the world to define us by this type of imagery the religion is defined by things like well that's the building that well, that's the church that has the preacher that. We've allowed the world to define us by what happens on Sundays in a church building. That the Christian faith has become known for only those things and nothing more. And because of this, when the world evaluates Christians, it concludes those are those self-righteous hypocrites. Because of this, Christians, when we evaluate ourselves, we conclude, well, I went to church today, so I know that God is on my side. Or, as I've heard it before, uh, we've, we've made the faith just about coming to take a sip and leave a tip, and nothing more. Because of this, Christian ceremonies today have grown increasingly about the worshipers, us, and not about the one being worshipped. You see, in our, our swipe up or scroll up society, our convenience and comfort driven society, we have the freedom to instantly change anything that is not immediately gratifying to us, that doesn't bring that immediate dopamine release, that dopamine, that, that feel good chemical that brings that rush of excitement. And happiness. You sit down to watch a movie or a TV show, and if the first 30 seconds doesn't grab you, you just turn the channel. You're, you're listening to the radio. There's a song you don't like. I don't think anybody even still listens to the radio anymore. Probably just like on your phones. You, just, you know, next. You know, if that, if that TikTok video wasn't funny enough, you just swipe to the next one. If your girlfriend or boyfriend made you mad, huh, there's, a, there's a, a billion more out there. Don't need that one. And because of this, Christian worship has suffered because we've tried to compete with that. If the, if the worship, if the sermon, if the, if the songs that we sing don't immediately grab our attention, eh, I'm just going to mentally check out. I, I saw a, a post the other day and then reshared it because I thought it was very accurate to the way that most of the popular Christianity and even ourselves can be guilty of at time. And the post said this. It said, how was worship must be removed from our Christian vernacular? It is a question only the object of our worship can answer. Our answer then to this question is revealing of what was really worshipped. Our experience has become the gauge, thus revealing that we in fact do not worship God. We worship our experience of worship. In essence, we worship ourselves. Idolatry is a sneaky thing. This true faith takes discipline. True faith takes obedience and patience and self-control. 
True faith doesn't seek to be self-pleasing, but seeks to be pleasing to God in all that we do. So, how do we combat this? How can we think rightly about the Christian faith? James gives us that answer. We're going to be doing a series through the book of James titled Religion Beyond Borders. The epistle of James was written to address this type of situation. What do we do in a world that associates Christianity with a building? What do we do when we have a faith that associates Christianity with well, I love worship because it makes me feel good. What would be left of our faith if all of that was taken away? What should be our religious identity? Who are we as Christians? Now, James is considered the Proverbs of the New Testament. Because the book of James is filled with practical wisdom and insights and commands on how to live a successful Christian life. Not, not a successful life, a successful Christian life. There's a big difference. James describes the lifestyle, the, the very way of life that Christians are to follow. And he does so using plain language and simple analogies and many imperatives. Half of the verses in the book in James are commands. Half of them. And so for our first lesson today, we're going to consider religion beyond ceremony. Ceremonies represent those occasional events which bear some significance to the faith. Uh, the content that James reveals to us is that our faith goes beyond, far beyond only ceremonial practices. The Christian faith, our faith, is not confined or limited, or relegated to only the ceremony that takes place on Sunday mornings. Christianity is a 24-7 lifestyle. Now, that being said, oh, I don't know what button I just hit. Give me one second, because I don't know how to hit it again. There we go. Now, that being said, there are two ceremonies that we see in the New Testament. Right, baptism and communion. Now, both of them pertain to salvation. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. Well, what about singing? What about prayer? What about fasting? What about reading scripture? What about having sermons? What about giving? So, just a little bit of a clarification. Uh, when it comes to ceremony, we're talking about that formalized ritual event that is for the express purpose of memorializing um, an event in the past. That's what we talk about when we talk about ceremony. It's something that is specifically prescribed as a formal part of the faith for a congregating purpose of sorts. Um, whereas something like singing, well, that in and of itself isn't a ceremony. It's something that can be a part of a ceremony, but it's also something that we can sing anytime. There's no limit to our singing. Well, whereas something such as communion, it has a very scripturally confined time and purpose for when we are to do such. And so baptism explicitly is the ceremony that one performs one time and at one point, at the point of desiring to acknowledge Christ as his or her Savior, to repent of their sins and have their sins forgiven by being buried and raised with Christ, to be united with him in the resurrection of a new life. That is the ceremony that brings forth God's salvation into an individual's life. And then we have the ceremony of communion, which memorializes the salvation through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. But as we return to James, when you read through it, there's something remarkable that you'll notice, or not notice for that matter. In James, there's, there's no gospel sermon, there's no baptism. There's no communion. There's no description of Jesus' divinity. There's no theology of Jesus' identity. So what are we to take from that? Well, these are all presupposed. 
These are truths that James' audience already know. James' audience is not questioning the gospel. They're not questioning their baptism. They're not questioning Jesus' identity. James is writing to a group that already understands all of these things. And because of those things, he's explaining how they are to live beyond those things. Outside of the church building. Outside of the Sunday. It's meant to be a way of life, not a checklist. See, in James we see that, okay, you know that Jesus is the Son of God? Check. You've heard the gospel? Check. You attended church this week? Check. You were baptized? Check. Christianity is more than just a checklist. And James should challenge us to consider, is that how we have viewed our faith? See, James is revealing to us the Christian lifestyle. What it's supposed to look like. What the life of a Christian looks like throughout time and across all cultures. Uh, Take, for example, farmers. If you look at farmers from just about any time period... Anywhere in the world, there are certain commonalities in their lifestyle. Because it's the lifestyle that farmers have to do their job. What do the farmers do? They wake up early, they tend to their animals, and they tend to their crops. That is true for all farmers at all times. We see that farmers... Now, West Virginia, not a big farming state. A little too hilly, a little too rocky. A little too, too much coal in our soil. But one of my best friends, his family, they, uh, they, they do potato farming. And they have a few hogs and stuff like that too. And, and I always heard them complain about the same things. They complain about, well, the market prices of, of potatoes. And, and then I move out here where farming is like, a, like, this is real farming out here. It's not like you have a little 200-acre hobby farm. It's like we're talking like thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of acres like, like real farming. And, and what do the farmers do out here? Well, they still get up early, they still take care of the animals, still take care of the crops, and they still what? They still complain about the market prices of corn and soybeans. They still complain about the weather. There are certain commonalities in the way of life of a farmer. Well, there are certain commonalities in the way of life of a Christian. So let's look at verse 1 to get a little bit more background into the letter of James and some principles that we can take from it. James 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion. Greetings. So who was James? James was the blood brother of Jesus. Matthew 13, 55 is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? James was also a doubter of Jesus. John 7, 3 through 5. For not even his brothers believed in him. James was also a criticizer. He was a critic of Jesus. In Mark three twenty one, we see that When his family heard of Jesus going forth and and doing his ministry of, of, of teaching and of healing and performing miracles, his family heard of it. They went out to seize him for they were saying, he's out of his mind. Jesus' own family were saying, Jesus is crazy. He's lost his marbles. He has gone insane. We must stop him from doing this. James doubted Jesus, he criticized Jesus, and because of this, he was not truly a brother of Jesus. In Matthew 12, 46 through 50, we we hear the famous words of Jesus. Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. See, see Jesus' family, they're, they're coming, they're looking for him, they're trying to grab him. And Jesus says, that those are not my brothers. My brothers, my sisters, they're the ones who do the will of my Father. That's who James was. But who is James now? 
into eternity. As he exists now and as he exists at the time of his writing. Who is James? We see that the same James who doubted Jesus, who criticized Jesus, who was not even considered as true family by Jesus himself because of his unbelief, we see a remarkable change in his character. We see his life transformed. See, James is a witness, an eyewitness to the resurrection of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15.7 Paul is accounting the resurrection of Jesus and he says, and he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. I think it's uh, an interesting point that, that Paul makes explicit mention that Jesus was intentional about going to his brother. And then afterwards, we see that James became the chair of the Jerusalem council. In Acts 15, you have the apostles gathering together. You have the church leadership in Jerusalem. And they are gathering together to discuss the issue of evangelizing the Gentiles. Hey, are we supposed to rightly teach the Gentiles about Jesus? Or is the Christian faith only meant to be preserved for the Jews? Does a Gentile have to become a Jew first and then become a Christian? Or can they just do they have a direct access to Christ? We don't know. What's going on here? So they have this council to discuss the matter. And James presides over that meeting. James makes the final determination that it is right to preach Christ to the Gentiles because that's what was prophesied in the Old Testament Scripture. James's presence in the Jerusalem church was so much so that he was considered not just a leader, but a true pillar of the church by Paul. And we see that because of James's role in the church, we can assume that he truly became a brother of Jesus when he obeyed the gospel. When he became a true obedient believer, that is when he became a true full brother of Christ. So who is James? James is a humble servant of God and of Jesus. We can see his humility in the fact that never once throughout the book of Acts, when we see different activities of James, nor in the epistle of James itself, we never see a single time where James uses his blood relation to Jesus to exercise authority over others. Now keep in mind, this is a culture that they put as the most highest importance your family connections. That's why Jesus had to show his connection with David, with King David. He had to be of that royal bloodline. Your family connection meant everything in terms of establishing your role in society. And we see James never use this. We can even think today, we don't put such value on our ancestry as they did. But even today, don't we like to kind of brag on our family members? If we, you know, we have a son who's captain of the football team, we brag on that. You know, we, we have a mom or a dad who's, who's like the, the owner of a bank or, or whatever the case may be. You know, we, we like to brag on our family members. We like to define ourselves by our relationship to our family members who are successful in life. And yet we see James never takes advantage of this. Never once does he mention that relationship. But we also see that uh, James is a martyr for the faith. And now this isn't recorded in Scripture, but in other historical accounts by uh, Josephus, who is a Roman historian, he records that James was killed in 62 A.D. by the Jews who threw him off the temple. Uh, it's estimated that the temple top was between 90 to 150 feet high. They took him to the top of the temple and they threw him off because they said he was preaching blasphemy. He was proclaiming Jesus as the Savior, the Son of God, the Messiah whom they crucified. And because of his preachings, the Jewish leadership threw him off the temple. But guess what? That didn't kill him. So he falls, he survives. And when the Jews see that he survived, they begin stoning him. And then when the rocks weren't enough, they broke out the clubs 
And they struck him until he died. And, and now one account says that he died in the same way that Jesus himself did and, and the disciple Stephen did. And that James's dying words were, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That was a humble servant. That was a martyr for the faith. That is who James is. That is the person who is writing this epistle for our learning, for our knowledge. Who is he writing to? We see in verse 1, he's writing to the dispersion. So who are the dispersion? Well, we see two different ways of construing this. I think both could be accurate. The New Testament dispersion, of course, would be the most directly related to James' audience. But that term dispersion is steeped in Jewish history, dating back to 597 B.C. The Old Testament dispersion occurred when God allowed the pagan nation of Babylon to conquer, to conquer the kingdom of Israel and Judah. And during that, the Babylonians took the Jews out of Jerusalem and made them exiles. Some went to Egypt. The majority went into the capital of Babylon to live as exiles. And these became known as the dispersion. They were the Jews who were now living outside of Jerusalem, the promised land. They were dispersed out of the land that God had promised them, which was Jerusalem. In Micah 6, 8, 6 verse 6 through 8, Mike is a prophet during this time. The Babylonians are, are actively conquering the Israelites. And part of Micah's message is addressing how the Israelites are going to live obediently to God in light of this. Because, remember, according to the Jewish religion, the temple is everything. The temple is the church. The temple is where all religion takes place. You don't have religion without the temple. It's where you go to worship God. It's where you go to offer sacrifices. It's where the priests reside. The temple is everything to religion. Without a temple, you have no religion. All that they know about their faith is based on being able to go to the temple to worship. So what does that leave them with when they don't have access to the temple? What does that leave them with when they no longer have a temple because it's to be destroyed and torn down? Does that mean that their faith is destroyed? Does that mean that God doesn't exist because the temple fell down? Does that mean that their whole faith is in vain and that they must accept false pagan gods and begin worshiping Babylonian gods? Because their whole religious system is based on being able to attend the temple. Micah writes in chapter 6, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before Him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Micah was telling the Jews how to have religion without a temple. Take away all the physical icons and imagery that you associate with religion. Take away the priests. Take away the sacrifices. What do you have left? You have the ability to do justice to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God. That is how you serve God. God isn't to be served on Saturdays in a temple with a sacrifice. That's not the true worship that He desires. What He desires, do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with Him. Then now let's fast forward to the New Testament. It is that type of background... That type of mindset that James is writing about. The fact that he uses the word dispersion 
makes that direct connection. So who are the New Testament dispersion? Well, after the Babylonian captivity was over, the Jews were allowed to go back to Jerusalem. Not all of them did. Some of them did. But throughout time, the Jews became tradesmen. And so they had uh, Jewish centers of worship throughout the Roman Empire during the time of Jesus. These became known as the synagogue. You see, they had to learn how to worship God without a temple. So they started the practice of building synagogues. These were the original house churches. And so when we read through Paul's ministry, and he's, he's traveling throughout the Roman Empire, Paul always goes where first? To the synagogues. To those who are already worshiping God. And it's these Jews that are living outside of Jerusalem that have converted to Christ, but they are living apart from Jerusalem. They are living apart from the apostles. They're living apart from where the first church started. That's the Christian dispersion. Those that are away from the central head. And we know that Christ is the head, but the central body of the church where the apostles were in Jerusalem. They're living out on their own. They've been rejected by their Jewish family. They're not accepted by Roman pagan idols. So what do they have left? How can we serve God when we're not welcomed in the synagogues? How can we serve God when the Romans don't accept us in their places of worship? How can we serve God when, when no one will trade with us because we're Christians? We have nothing to offer. We have no sacrifices to give. We have no place to meet for worship. We don't even know who we are. We, we've lost our sense of identity. And this is why James is writing to them. To remind them that religion goes beyond the ceremony of a worship service. That religion is not confined to that synagogue. That religion is not confined to sacrifices. That religion is an everyday lifestyle. So James gives them a letter to teach them practical Christian living despite the obstacles and the temptations that they are enduring. So where does that leave us? The letter of James is for people outside of the church. The letter of James is for, for people outside of when ceremony is happening. So the question is, who are you when you're not sitting in the pews? Who are you on a Monday, on a Tuesday, on a Friday, on a Saturday night? Who are you when there's no worship going on? Who are you when there's no religious ceremony occurring? Who are you when you are not with your Christian friends and Christian family? Are you the type of person that James describes? Because the person James describes is a Christian. And it's the culture, it's the lifestyle that James is making an imperative for all Christians to live by. See, our faith, our religion goes beyond the ceremony of a Sunday. It is an everyday lifestyle. So we see that the author of this letter is James. We see that the audience is the dispersed Christian Jews. And we see that the purpose is teaching us how to live outside of Sundays. I'll ask again, how are you living outside of Sundays? What struggles are you dealing with that we can help you with. This Christian life, it's not easy. If it was easy, James wouldn't have had to write this letter. If it was easy to do, it wouldn't have been needed. Because it had been getting it right from the beginning. But just as they could be lost and confused and not know the right thing to do and be subject to persecution and be subject to temptations, we are subject to those things as well. So if there's anyone here this morning that needs some help with their Christian walk outside of a Sunday service. If there's anyone here that wants to become a true brother or sister of Jesus, a true son or daughter of God, 
we see that the way that that's accomplished is through the waters of baptism. When you join Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection, James was always a half-blood brother of Jesus. But he didn't become accepted by Jesus as a true brother until he was obedient to the gospel. And you have that opportunity to do the same here today. Whatever your needs are, we ask that you would please let us know as together we stand and sing.